This program is brought to you by thepodcastfactory.com. How would you like to get more customers, make more profits, and have bigger breakthroughs? Get Doberman Dan's profit boosting breakthroughs. Normally, this would cost you $98 per month, but right now, for listening to this show, he's giving you a free copy of his Doberman Dan letter. All you have to do is go to DobermanDan.com and sign up to get your free copy now. Prepare yourself for the uncensored, nothing held back, no BS reality of how business and life really work. Doberman Dan is off the chain. I'm excited about our guest. Craig Simpson, he and I have known each other for a while now and have worked on several projects together, and I am just trying to figure out how to unmute him. (laughs) Craig has a vast knowledge of direct mail that we're going to talk about, and um, I'll give a little bit of his background. Craig started out handling the direct mail for Ken Roberts. If anybody remembers Ken Roberts, we're, we're going back to the 80s. This was before I knew, I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about mail order, but I used to get these Ken Roberts mailers that were so exciting looking. There were these booklets, like five, five and a half by eight and a half booklets. Yeah. Had a picture of him with a big cowboy hat. Yeah, I just I knew nothing about this stuff, but they looked like they were valuable. And so instead of me pitching it like any other junk mail, you know, like offers for credit cards, I read those things and yeah. they sucked me in. And I had no interest in real estate investing whatsoever. Um, I had interest in making more money, but I was I was in a variety of crappy jobs, but I would literally read those cover to cover and get all excited. I think the reason I never ordered was the the real estate angle of it turned me off because I, I, I just made assumptions that were incorrect, that you had to go into a lot of debt and you had to have big bucks and blah, blah, blah. But I was fascinated by those things and you were the guy sending those out. Yeah, I sent him out. But I would. I did more of his stuff in the '90s. In the '80s, he would have had. Uh, he was doing them personally, but I did them in the the '90s. I mailed out tens of millions of those digest size booklets. So when he was when he first started mailing in the '80s, he was mailing a foreclosure type real estate course, and then the '90s, where it was really big, was the commodity um, course. So that he was selling. So it was. Uh, it was. We had amazing success with those little digest booklets. Well, One of the funny things was we had they had an amazing shelf life. You know, people would get them, and they would be anywhere from fifty six to seventy pages long, and they would put them down somewhere on a desk or on a you know end table or something. And sometimes you know they wouldn't call for six months or a year. Or sometimes even two years later, they'd pick that thing up and read them. They just wouldn't throw them away because it was like a book. And then they would call and order a year a year or two later. Sometimes. <laughs> well, I did the same thing. I kept those things around. It looked, you know, again, now, now knowing what I know about direct mail, it's, I look at those things differently, but back then I was just a layman, but it sure looked like something valuable to me. So, you know, not only did I keep it around, I, I read the thing cover to cover. It was exciting. I was excited back. I knew it wanted to make more money and that's what he was talking about. So, but, uh, I'd rather you tell us more about your background. Craig's an expert in direct mail. He's my, he's a handful of go-to guys that I go to about direct mail. Of course, now that Gary Halbert is dead, he's been scratched off the list unless y'all can figure out how to do a seance with him. Uh, he was uh, a person I consulted regularly and I'm connected with, just about all the big players in direct mail. I mean, these are people who either send out tens of millions of pieces of direct mail or people who supervise the sending out of hundreds of millions of pieces of direct mail a year and see every possible control that is working in direct mail 
And, um, you know, Craig's an expert in the direct mail business. He specializes in generating prospects and customers through physical snail mail. And he's also, so he's one of my go-to guys, one of a handful, I'm talking three or four people, go-to guys for direct mail. He's also happens to be the go-to guy for uh, uh, a rather well-known marketer y'all may have heard of named Dan Kennedy. So um, there are very few people who have reached as many people as Craig has through direct mail and, and uh, very few people have tracked in incredible detail results of the number of campaigns that 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 he has at last count what craig you'd mailed over 200 million direct mail pieces yeah i actually stopped counting then i mean i was uh, that was actually oh, well over uh, a year or two ago i just kind of gave up on keeping a, a log but it's well over 200 million pieces and uh, <laughs> that's that's a heck of a lot of mail I, I don't even think people can imagine the amount of mail if you saw that amount of mail I, I mean, at one time I saw a, a quarter of a million pieces being mailed of mine on a pallet. And to me, that just looked like a massive amount. So I can't imagine 200 million. It la- you probably you stopped counting in sales too. At last count, you yep. sold what, 100 million in products and services just using direct mail exclusively, right? Right. I mean, I did that with just uh, Ken Roberts alone. In one year, we sold over 100 million in products through 100% through direct mail. So there's been actually quite a few other companies where I've sold over 100 million dollars for them through direct mail. But you know, it's yeah, I just you just it takes more time to track it than it's worth at this point. So I don't I don't <laughs> keep the tally on that. And you're currently uh, you send out and supervise about 250. Mail campaigns a year is is that about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do high volume. And the, the cool thing about you is you understand the kitchen table entrepreneur up to the guys who are literally dropping millions or tens of millions of pieces a month. I mean, you you strategize and coordinate mailings as small as it literally as small as two hundred fifty pieces. You know, to what well, I believe you told me one of your largest single drop mailings was almost six million pieces, five million seven hundred and change. So you know right. the plight of both the kitchen table entrepreneur and the and the big huge mailers, and you've seen the results and tracked the results of all of those. Yeah, exactly. And you know, one of the nice things is what you know find out as we dive into this call and talk a little bit more in detail is that. You know, the same tactics and, and strategies can work for the t- kitchen table entrepreneur that also work for the guys and the big companies that are mailing tens of millions of pieces of mail out. Um, it's not like it changes between because of the size. It's actually very similar in, in the, the angle and the approach that you would use. That, that makes perfect sense. You know, you and I have never talked about this, but I, I mean, I know – you worked with Ken Roberts, but I don't know the real story about how you got started in direct mail. Right. You know, it's interesting because, uh, yeah, I mean, Ken Roberts was really was my foundation in really building and getting really good at direct mail. But before that, what got me the job working for Ken was I had done some direct mail for my own little business. Um, and I had this weird business of of selling rock climbing holds through the mail. And if you've ever seen those fake rock walls where you bolt on these rocks and then you people climb up them, well, I had built this 20 foot high rock climbing wall in my parents' backyard. I was 19 years old and I, um, after spending all the money on the plywood and the steel to build the thing, I didn't have any money left. And so I had to make these these fake rocks by hand. And so I, you know, cause I couldn't go out and buy them and I ended up making them and, and bolting them to my wall. And my buddies came over and we all climbed on it and everyone's like, these are really cool. You should try selling these. So anyways, I ended up started selling these rock climbing holds, these fake rocks. And that was where I first started using direct mail. And I put together my first direct mail campaign and I only mailed out like 250 pieces. And it was literally a kitchen table job, right? I was there printing each piece out individually, folding it, stuffing it, addressing it, the whole nine yards. 
and uh, I sat by the phone thinking, man, I've mailed these things out, and it's going to ring off the hook, and I'm going to get hundreds of orders, <laughs> and the phone <laughs> did not ring. Many, you, many, I only mailed 250 pieces. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm dying to know, how did you know who to target? Well, I didn't. That was part of my problem. My first campaign was a complete bomb. I, I did not uh, – I targeted the wrong group, and I, I sat by the phone waiting for it to ring, thinking, oh, this is going to be great, and nobody called in, and so I was pretty discouraged, but I didn't give up, and I kept on testing and, and researching until I found a system that worked, and I ended up selling over 4,000 rocks to the mail. So, you know, talk about an odd product. You're selling a rock – through the mail, you know, and uh, anyway, so I found the system and it ended up working really well, and I got tired of the manufacturing of kind of, you know, putting the holes together, and, and uh, that's when I went and talked to Ken and got a job working for him and kind of took my experience of direct mail to the next level. This is a true kitchen table business. I mean, you're literally making the rocks yourself, right? Yeah, I made them. I had a little. I built a little shop on the side of my parents' garage, and I, you know, I was 19, living at home. I was all into rock climbing, and and I'd found this way that using polyester resins and sand to make these fake rocks. And so I was the manufacturer, and I was the the marketing guy, and 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 so I would you know, do the, ad, do the direct mail campaigns or print ads, and then I would get the calls, and then I'd go and make the rocks. And over the course of about uh, two years, I sold 4,000 rocks to the mail. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's pretty cool because, uh, well, first of all, that's a niche I had never, I would have never thought of selling to. And then, and, and then my next problem would be how the hell do you reach people who want fake rocks? Well, you, you know, in that case, I mean, that's a great example. I mean, in that case, you're going after people who have purchased rock climbing supplies to the mail. So if somebody has bought ropes or harnesses or shoes or those kind of things, it tells you that they're, uh, you know, that they're a buyer and they're, they're a rock climber. And if you find those that are, have purchased products through the mail, then now you know that not only are they a rock climber, but they're also direct mail responsive. And so, you know, that's kind of how you start out and narrow down a list for rock climbers to go after them and mail them, uh, you know, a, a sales piece promoting buying rocks, fake rocks. Hmm. And so, so you worked for Ken, which I'm sure was like, as far as immersion in direct mail, that was probably being thrown, shown up for the beginner swim class and being thrown in at the deep end of the pool that was, <laughs> you know, stocked with sharks with freaking lasers on their head. So <laughs> I'm sure that was like a pretty amazing experience. What, what oh. was your big take away from working with uh, Ken and him mailing the huge quantities? Wow. I mean, there was uh, so many takeaways. I think the thing is, is back then it was when I, when I started there, there was no internet, you know, when I, when I, when I left to go work on my, to be a freelancer on my own, we had the internet. But when I first started that, the only thing that was, was direct mail. I mean, we were doing, there was some print ads and you could do TV or radio, but we were 95% direct mail. And, you know, we, we would just, I guess the two biggest takeaways were, one, we were always testing, and two, we tracked everything in extreme detail because we had to know what was working and what, what was not working, and that way we knew better how to roll out our campaigns by looking at the past results. So tracking was huge and testing, always testing stuff. You know, you mentioned seeing picture, uh, you know, getting a sales piece with Ken and a picture, um, you know, with a cowboy hat on. Well, we tried Ken in a baseball hat. We tried him in a suit. We tried color. We tried black and white. We tried in a dress shirt. We tried in a denim shirt. And the one that got the highest response rate was when we put Ken in a cowboy hat and a denim shirt. That's, what the, that's the one that people most responded to. So we tested every little variable to find out what was it that was going to make the response the highest. Wow. This is, I don't want to get into technical anal stuff. <laughs> I'm I'm just curious. I mean, because this was back in the '90s, the the technology has changed a lot. How in the world? You don't have to get in the specifics, but how in the world did you keep track of all these different tests? Was this simply a paper and ink thing, or did you use Excel? Or I'm just curious. 
We actually did have Excel, you know, we did have Excel back, you know, Excel was around and obviously we used it heavily. I mean, we have, and I actually use a very similar tracking program today that I used, you know, back in the mid nineties because it's, it, it's it, an Excel spreadsheet that works really well and it's easy to track and easy to, to keep track of all those details and variables. So yeah, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, anything cutting edge. It was just a simple Excel spreadsheet. That's that's a mistake I've made in the past by not keeping meticulous records on the testing and like something works better and I get excited so I start rolling out with that but I don't keep a, a historical record of the stuff that had been tested in the past and then I forget so right yeah I was just curious about that. And that's so, something that I, I mean, that's something that I really, you know, that's helped me to get where I'm at with, with direct mail is, you know, I've done thousands, thousands and thousands of mailings and every one I've got a tracking report for so I can see what worked and what didn't and, and in different niches too, you know, and, and testing formats. If there's a commonality between one niche and another and I see that I did a similar test and they both have the same type of result, you know, I'm able to apply that to future mailings knowing, hey, I've got good scientific backing on what works and what doesn't. I've got probably a similar Excel spreadsheet, which which helps track all that. Plus, you can have historical data on the various lists and then actually go back and figure out what your best performing lists are. So when you want to go and test something new, you know, like, oh, you know, historically, this list usually performs really well for me on everything I test on it. So let's start here and then work our way down. It's just absolutely essential to keep track of all those tiny little details. Like who would have imagined so many tiny little details in that Ken Roberts test? I mean, what kind of hat he wears, what kind of shirt he wears, who would have thought that would have made such a difference? Right. And, you know, the thing we were looking for was even if, even if the change of the cowboy hat or baseball hat to a cowboy hat, even if it only increased response by a tenth of a percent or less, you know, one hundredth of a percent, if you find three or four variables that each raise it, say, a tenth of a percent, well, that, that you know, if you, if you get five of those, that's a half a percent increase in response by combining them all together. So we weren't looking for home runs or grand slams. We were looking for just a small bump in response that we could count on, and we add a whole bunch of those together, and in return, it keeps bringing up the and boosting up the response rate. I, I promise I'm going to get back on track in a second because I want to find out from Ken Roberts how you wound up doing what you do now and what kind of businesses you work with. But I, I, I got to get off track just for a minute, mostly for, to be totally transparent, mostly for selfish reasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> I need to feel vindicated with a uh, totally dysfunctional client I had to let go. <laughs> uh, you know, um, what you said about all these little things that, I mean, you didn't expect a change in hat or a change in denim shirt to all of a sudden, you know, boost your response to this home run thing, you know, that, you know, went from whatever it was bringing in 1% to, you know, all of a sudden having, having this home run 5% thing. It was all these different things that added up and made the difference. I found that most online marketers, because it's so easy it's so easy to start an online marketing business and it's so easy to basically do the old throw mud against the wall and see what mm-hmm. sticks. Their testing and tracking suck. Usually in many cases, it's non-existent. They are just completely guessing. They've tried something that works better, but they can't go back and historically tell you the results of their various tests. All it is is Eh, let's just try this and throw some mud up against the wall and see what works. If it works better, they stick with it. Um, as opposed to keeping meticulous track of tiny, I mean, of course, yes, start with the things that make the biggest difference. You know, headline changes, lead, lead changes, offer changes, you know, that kind of stuff, price changes. Yeah, obviously start with those, but then if they would start testing the things that make the smaller changes, 
you know, they, it's like the online marketers poo poo that like, oh man, I got, you know, a fraction of a percent increase. Yeah, man. But five or six or 10 different things that bring a tiny fraction of a percent increase adds up. And in direct mail, you guys had to do that because of the expense. But since exactly. a lot of online marketers believe that it's cheap or free to market online or it's free to market via email, by the way, it, it's free to market you know, via email or social email if, if you're somebody who places no value whatsoever on your time. So no, it's not free. But because right. that's the attitude they have, they don't keep these meticulous records, and they are screwing themselves out of so much money. They could learn so much from the direct mail guys. It's crazy. It really is. It's crazy. And you know, because of the amount of money that goes into direct mail, we really had to be meticulous, as you mentioned. And and we can't just throw spaghetti at a wall and see what sticks. We want to we want to account for every dollar spent, and we want to find out how to get the biggest return on investment for every single campaign that we do. So let's test all those little details. Let's test, you know, cowboy hats and denim shirts and you know sidebars and testimonials. And you know, we've seen where we just change out one testimonial can change the response of the entire piece. So um, there's so many things that you know with copy, obviously being a good copywriter that you are, that, that you can do in a sales piece by and making an incremental change that gives you a little lift in response. Exactly. And, and I got a, I, I've got a bunch of questions that I want to get back on track with, but, but first again, totally because I'm just a selfish bastard and I need to, uh, this I need to turn this into a therapy session, Craig. You're not my therapist. I need I, I need I need you to help me feel vindicated so I can get rid of these guilt feelings. How often do you get a new direct mail piece written and have it go out and it is a home run grand slam home run right from the get go? Oh man. Um, that's a good question. That's a tough one. I mean, you know, the thing we're always shooting for is we want to get a base hit. Let's, let's get it out there. Let's try and get uh, a marginal or good, you know, marginal good to good result. You know, we're not expecting a grand slam. And the reason why is because there are too many variables in every single direct mail campaign to try and hit that grand slam the first time out. Really what you're trying to do is get a piece that does okay and then build on it. The really successful companies in the mail, they do it this way. The guys that aren't mailing who have tried direct mail have probably tried to throw spaghetti on the wall the first time and expect that it work, it's going to work phenomenal, and then they walk away from it because it's not doesn't reach their expectations. You know, Ken mailed. Um, you know, we ended up mailing tens of millions of pieces year after year. His first mailings were not a huge success; they were marginal. And, he, and we would have to constantly test and tweak the piece to make it better and better and better until we got to the point where we could mail millions and millions of names. So, you know, the reality is, is yes, we would love to hit a grand slam the first time out, but that's not realistic. I mean, it's rare for even a professional baseball player to go step up to the plate first time and hit a grand slam. It just doesn't happen. Now, base hit is very realistic, and that's what we should shoot for. Is let's get one base hit, and let's get a double, and then a triple, and let's just keep going until we get the piece to the, where, to the point of where we want it. It's kind of a step-by-step -step process. When you say base hit, or let's just go with a specific example. Back when you were with Ken Roberts, when you said, all right, so there's, they created a new, new mail piece or hire a new copywriter to create a mail piece. And they get it out there, and it was like a marginal success or or a base hit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. What did that mean in terms of numbers? Did that mean that they were a little bit negative per per each? Well, that's a, I mean that's a really required that's, that's, or. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, this may be a bigger uh, conversation, and we can dive into it if you want. But we actually, believe it or not, all our mailings were mailed as a negative because we would lose money on our, every campaign on the front end. But our, the, val the lifetime value of every customer brought in was so high that we knew we'd recoup that money over the course of the next 90 days. So we would mail it a negative. It just depends on when we, when we calculate in 
based on the return on investment each client would bring us, we would look at it and say, okay, based on the return on investment that these clients are going to bring us, we on this mailing made 10% or something. And we look at that and say, okay, that's marginal. Let's go ahead and figure out how we can make this piece even better. And that, then we would start testing other things like a new headline, a new introduction. And we may do a mailing where we have six different pieces going out. Each one just has one variable that we're testing, one variable difference that we're testing. So we can quickly get out there, test a whole bunch of stuff, and find out what's going to work best you know, in a short period of time rather than stretching it out over the year. Did you ever get to the point through all the tweaking um, of certain pieces that you actually, your customer acquisition actually came in at break even? Oh, yeah. You know, we, there was, so if I did a mailing, you know, it was, it was not uncommon to do a million piece mailing. It was not uncommon. The thing is, is we're going to a pretty broad universe. So our core list, the ones that were the best, we would actually make a profit on them. And then there would be those that we broke even on. But because of the size of the million was so huge and we're going to such a broad group, the overall result was a negative. But we knew that we would make that a positive with the lifetime values of the customer. Gotcha. You know, we may need to touch on that again a little later because, see, this is this is the part that for some reason so many people don't understand. It's even worse with online marketing only people. I mean, I know I have clients that have wasted a year trying to get a positive ROI front end, and in the process, they have they've wasted an entire year on making a hell of a lot of money. So the online marketing guys are really guilty of not understanding this and even some direct mailers. So I'd like to put a pin in that subject for a minute and come okay. back. To it. I okay, have whenever you want to talk about it. <laughs> and I, I appreciate you giving me um, the, the, the freedom to, to go off track here on other things. I have 2.32 p.m. I'm on Eastern time on my clock. So you should start your billing clock right now. It's now just turned 2.33. Okay, start your billing clock right now for your psychotherapist fees. <laughs> now I'm going to turn this into my psychotherapy session. So let's just say, for example, that I'm totally making this up. And a guy named SWIM, that stands for someone who isn't me, writes a direct mail piece for a client and also sets the expectation for the client that even the best of the best, you know, copywriters to get paid a million dollars to write copy and, you know, have product managers that make millions and marketing experts like Boardroom and Agora and these guys who make mail hundreds of millions of pieces, even they just they just don't expect a home run out of the, out of the gate. Totally. And so this guy's idea of a home run was from the mailing that he would immediately be making money. Now two problems there: his price per product was way too high. I like to see a minimum 8x markup on stuff sold in mail order via direct mail. 10, 10x markup is really my preferred minimum because of all, you know it gives you way more money to work with in marketing. Mm-hmm. This guy's markup was absolutely abysmal, but yet he still, in spite of me, I'm sorry, in spite of in spite of Swim, that guy, my friend, someone who isn't me setting the expectation and explaining that a grand slam home run is so rare. We got better chance of winning the lottery. So here's what to expect. We're going to have some kind of results. The results are going to be one of two things. We knew what we, what the allowable cost per acquisition would be. And so we're either going to come in under that. So we're going to be negative. And at that point, we just need to tweak some things to get it up to the allowable cost per acquisition, which for him was, I think it was a darn, it was darn close to break even, or if it was a little bit negative, he knew his back end numbers and he was cool with it. 
So we didn't hit that allowable cost per acquisition. And so instead of allowing SWIM to make some immediate changes that have could have made some very dramatic differences in response, because we were pretty darn close, instead he abandoned it and decided what he needed was an entirely new mail piece. So uh, w- would you agree that that guy was dysfunctional and probably really screwed up? Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. You know, and then the fortunate thing, unfortunate thing is that he's missing out on what could potentially be, and most likely from, from what you've told me, could be a very successful direct mail campaign and a very successful way for him to attract new customers, new qualified customers. I mean, I think it's, it's foolish to, to take that path and, uh, and you know, it's too bad that he didn't he didn't uh, take take into account the long term value or even the chance to try and improve the piece to get it from you know maybe marginal or okay to to good or great. Uh, it's just really his loss, unfortunately. Knowing the numbers and knowing where he had to be at, we were so close. I mean, I, and of course I had a, a slew of headlines to test. And we even had some different offers to test. We could have gotten that thing not only to his allowable cost per acquisition, which was still a little bit negative. I have no doubt we could have gotten him to break even if I would have been allowed to do what I do. But instead, because he's impulsive and he's also one of these guys who's seduced by every what I call BSO, bright, shiny object that is the latest flavor of the month of marketing online, he totally dropped this and decided he needed a new mail piece. And I even told him, you know, I even told this new mail piece is going to perform way worse than the first one. The first one, even without tweaking, was so damn close, he could have rolled out with it. It just would have taken a little bit longer to to be in the profit than he wanted, but he could have rolled out. Very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, there is. You, you, it's, it's always great. I mean, for for if you're in direct mail to have something, a piece that you have some results on that are, you know, if if, if they're decent or okay, that's great. That's a perfect piece to start with because you can always make it better. But when you start from scratch um, with nothing, like him creating this new piece, you have a much greater chance of it completely bombing. So you have greater risk with that second piece than you do with fixing the first one and making it better. Yep. Absolutely. That's something people need to understand that, yes, we dream of, well, all marketers tell the stories. No, nobody shares. I mean, I've shared a bunch of my failures. Nobody shared. Even Gary Halbert never shared his failures. I saw some huge failures working with Halbert. Okay, these guys, these gurus never share these. The story is always the same. I launched this, and in 24 hours, I made a bazillion dollars. There, are, For every story like that, there are as many as 99 stories about just abject failure. And so it sets, it sets a totally unrealistic expectation, especially with direct mail. We, we're more likely not going to get this a home run. We may not even get to second base or first base. We may get halfway to first base on our first try. But then we know from that point, based on that information, what to tweak and what to change to get this thing to first base. And first base alone may be the basis that allows us to roll out and make millions of dollars with just the first base piece. That's right. So I totally went off track here. I'm, tell me okay. what happened. You feel better now? <laughs> I do. And the good, time good. is two forty. So whatever your psychotherapist fees are, that was seven minutes, I believe. Send the bill. Okay. <laughs> so, so from Ken Roberts, what happened? Because I know you're you're freelance now, and you manage. This is your business. You you manage. You're a full service direct mail management service. I'm just curious how you. What what took you from Ken Roberts to doing what you do now? 
Well, you know, Ken, uh, Ken basically got to the point where he had made so much money and he was ready to wind things down. And, and he's been in retirement for, for quite a few years now. And I still actually stay in contact with him occasionally. I email with him once a quarter or so and talk to him probably once a year. But basically, he was winding things down. And so I, I started having people actually calling me and saying, hey, you know, I, um, can you do for us what you've been doing for Ken? And I'm like, yeah. And eventually, I, I built up enough clients. And so for the last eight years, I've been a direct mail consultant and coach. Uh, marketing all sorts of stuff, information products. And I work with dentists and contractors and medical doctors and uh, financial planners and attorneys. And I even have a clothing wholesaler. I mean, software companies. I mean, just about something in every niche, I've got somebody that I'm doing direct mail for. And we're doing it successfully. And a lot of that starts with, you know, when I'm working with them, helping manage their expectations, uh, kind of like you, what, you know, you've dealt with with your uh, client that we were just talking about, you know, explaining how the direct mail process works, uh, what we're looking to achieve, and then how to get them, you know, a, a consistent flow of new customers or prospects coming through their doors. By the way, I, our conference call service was limited to under, only 100 people, and we had a lot more than 100 register. Of course, we, I, I know that you know only percentage you register show up, but um, we're pretty damn close to filling up our 100 seats here. So that's Very cool. People were obviously interested in your message. So you're working with not just the typical business that uses direct mail like Agora or Boardroom or or Nightingale Kona, you're even working with brick and mortar, like professional people like dentists and doctors and housing contract, all kinds of different people yeah. that you wouldn't think of using direct mail. You're working with them and using direct mail successfully to help them generate customers and leads then. That's exactly right. I mean, it goes everything from, you know, obviously I work with a lot of information marketers and companies that are like Agora and Boardroom. I have those, but I also have, you know, like pet food stores. You know, I've got 20 pet food stores that I do marketing for, and we're driving uh, customers into the store. And, and mostly we're driving new prospects into the store, getting, you know, ge generating new people so that it's not just going back to the old customers over and over again, but we're actually bringing you know, new buyers in the store that become uh, long-term clients. So it's everything under the sun with uh, with with retail and and attorneys and, and dentists. And it's there's just a system with direct mail where you can drive the right targeted prospects into your business and help them, uh, you know, walk them through a sequence of becoming a long-term client. I get really frustrated with the online marketing only people, or especially the what we call the IM market. These are the, the dreamers who buy, you know, the magic uh, riches button on the internet. You know, what? Well, here's a special button you just push on the internet and it spits out a hundred dollar bills. And, and on top of that, you know, our upsell for that is going to teach you how to outsource the pushing of the button to the Philippines for, you know, a dollar an hour. I, I get fed up with these people because they dismiss direct mail is like outdated when they couldn't be more mistaken. It has been, um, you know, I started in direct mail in, um, you know, space ads because the, the internet wasn't a viable medium. For a short time, I dropped it to focus exclusively on the internet. And then when I saw my income go down rapidly, go down 50%, I realized that was a big mistake and I needed to start up my direct mail, my offline stuff again. But th there is not, nothing more targeted you could do than direct mail. And I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm constantly fighting against ignorance here to, to educate people of why they should add this to their marketing mix. I'm not saying drop all this great online marketing are not saying to drop email, even though, I mean, look at your email open rates. It's pathetic. Your, your delivery rates are pathetic. Your open rates are even worse. In, in direct mail, it is exponentially higher. If you do it right, your delivery rates are damn near 100%. And if you do it right, your open rates are, are going to be at least 
you know, 50 to 100 times higher than email. But I feel like I'm a lone voice in the wilderness, like uh, trying to get people to do what will help them, but yet they prejudge and blow it off as something that's outdated. But let's talk about Google for a minute, okay? Nobody would yeah. argue that Google is the 500 pound gorilla online. I mean, we're talking a company that most people can't fathom the size of, a multi billion dollar a year company who owns many other tech companies that is expanding at a rate that's insane. You know, Google is going to own the world. They're the number one search engine with hundreds of millions of visitors a month. They are probably the most massive entity online. On top of that, they're probably the most trusted entity online. And But yet, to get clients for their advertising services, guess what they're relying on? Direct mail. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a funny thing you think about. You know, this, this massive online company is using direct mail to promote their Google AdWords program. You know, they're, and uh, the one interesting fact I just read recently is that when you look at the 10 largest technology mailers in the country, and that would include companies like AT&T and Verizon and Dell, um, Google is the eighth largest technology mailer in the country. So here they are, this massive online gorilla, and they are using direct mail to get people to come use their AdWords program. And they're not just doing small mailings, they're large enough and mailing enough quantity that they're the eighth largest technology mailer in the country, which blows me away. You know, it's like the, it's like the cable company sending you a direct mail piece telling you should come advertise on television. You know, well, TV advertising is so great, why don't you advertise on TV to get new clients, right? So they're using direct mail to get clients to advertise on online. <laughs> and, you know, it's not just Google using direct mail. I mean, just about every Fortune 500 company is using direct mail, too. It's not heavily promoted because it's not the shiny object. But when you look closely at them, you're going to find that, you know, the Walmarts and Apple and Ford and AT&T and, you know, Microsoft, all those companies that are major big businesses in America, they're all using direct mail. And it's just not heavily promoted like uh, the Internet is because it's not new. But it is the old reliable media that even guys like Google will go back to because they know that's where a great source for them to get new customers. I, I won't get into it, but I I have some research. I mean, I, I have some research that's pretty amazing. MRI studies done on this. I won't I won't prolong this this interview. But and a, a really high number of people, like ninety percent of the people, say they collect their mail from the mailbox almost every day, and almost as high a percentage read or go through their mail that very same day um, as opposed to email. So delivery rate, open rate, trumps email. Then there's some crazy stuff that goes on inside your brain as compared to reading an email message or an online message. Hard copy direct mail triggers parts of the brain that are responsible for retention, and certain emotions and 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 endorphins and cyto somethings that I can't remember that is simply not duplicatable in any other me in, in any other media. And so, you know, these guys these big guys know it. And if you know, you should take a clue. If companies like that if it's that common for companies that big like Google to use direct mail for their business, you know, we should be looking at the same. I mean, it, you, it's, it's really common, isn't it? You see all the big players using direct mail, don't you? Oh, totally. I mean, you look at your mailbox every week. There's something from one of them, and they're every week, if not every day. You know, they're all using it. It's just not talked about like the Internet is. It's just not the bright and shiny object right now. Who is the clothing store that um, 
who is they they're still they've got they've got no physical stores they're oh, online yeah. only but yet yeah. they're mailing catalogs and they attribute like up to 70% of their sales from their online site from their their their, their paper and ink catalogs who is that uh, it's called Serena and Lily, and they actually sell home decor, furniture, rugs, etc. They did open their first store recently, but other than that, they've until this year they've been 100% uh, through the mail. And it's odd because here they are, this on the you know online store selling home decor. Now, normally, if you're going to go buy a rug or a, some kind of furniture or something to decorate your house with, you want to be able to see it and feel it and touch it. But they have been widely successful by just doing direct mail, mailing out a catalog. And they say that 65 to 70% of their total sales can be traced back to a print catalog. So they were an online retailer selling physical products through the mail and have had tremendous success. Um, not just mailing a few hundred thousand catalogs, but mailing millions of catalogs. It's been huge. And it's not just them. There are a lot of other companies, too, that, you know, the, the, the catalog business is a billion-dollar-year business, multi-billion-dollar-year business. And, you know, these companies wouldn't spend that kind of a money mailing out a physical catalog if it wasn't getting them a great return on investment. So, yeah, Serena and Lily is just one of those great examples of very successful online-based companies using direct mail, just like Google. It's slipping my mind now, but there's a clothing company. It's aimed towards a younger demographic who has a ton of physical locations. Do you remember the name? I don't, but I know I, I can't remember who it is. But I remember uh, we talked about this recently, and I can't remember who that company is. I should know it, but yeah, there's one, there's one, there's one in the mall here in town. Um, I, I mean, they've got physical locations, they've got the retail stores all over the country. A hugely popular name. If I remember it, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I, I'll say it, but. They they send out millions upon millions of catalogs, and they attribute an ungodly amount of their sales. I mean, I'm going from memory, but I was thinking it was like 75 to 80 well, percent from their catalogs. They're a huge clothing company. You know, so we, we need to take a clue from these guys this is a very effective way to market, and I, and I want to pick your brain about what are what are the, some of the direct mail secrets for driving prospects to an online sales funnel. And the reason I want to talk about that first is because a lot of my folks already have an online business, and it's it's a different. I mean, it can always be incorporated, and it's easy to incorporate. I've done it a million times. But, you know, driving to phone requires some extra things. You're going to need a phone center. You're going to need to train them, yada, yada, yada. But most of my folks already have an online site. So rather than go through the, the, the expense and the process of setting up a phone center to use the direct mail to drive to a phone center, how can they best use direct mail for driving prospects to their existing online sales funnel? Well, there's a couple of different tips that I give out for that, and, and uh, we're not going to have time to go in through, you know, through all the suggestions for it, but I can give you a few easy ones. Um, and and I, mail out, I probably send out at least 100 millions a year where we're driving prospects online, which is becoming a, more and more popular as more and more people who have online businesses realize that direct mail works, they are starting to get into the mail too to drive new prospects online. Um, the first thing is I suggest is making sure that you use the right length of copy. You know, it, it, you don't need to, to write a 32-page magalog or a long-form envelope package, you know, long-form sales letter to get people to go online. It's kind of an overkill if you write, you know, a twelve page letter to drive somebody online. What I've seen the most success with is is having the right length of copy, keeping it down to say an oversized postcard that's, you know, eight and a half by eleven or six by eleven. I'm sorry, eight and a half by five and a half or a six by eleven postcard or mm -hmm. a, a small self mailer. Those are the the length of copy for that is is 
perfect for driving somebody online. Now, if you're selling a $1,200 medical procedure, that's when you need the long form sales letter, the Magalog, or the Digest. But for driving people online, make sure your copy's not, you're not doing an overkill with a copy and making it too long. And, and we both know the, the more you tell, the more you sell. So I am a big fan of longer copy, but I've seen the most success for driving people online sticking with just the postcard size or, a, or a, like a small self-mailer. The second thing is, or did you have a question there, Dan, or do you want me to keep talking? No, just a comment. Um, it's okay. just because I'm actually currently working with they, they, I don't know if this is the official name of it. This is what the company, the postcard company called it. They call it a sumo postcard. It's six by 11. And, um, it, it, it the, the purpose is to drive to a, to a website, to a video sales letter. And there is plenty of room for all the copy necessary I need to drive them to the site. So. You know, and in fact, I could probably even get by with the regular size, whatever it is, four and a half by five and a half or four, four by six postcard with, and still have enough room for copy to drive to a site. You don't need that much copy to drive to a website. Right. The cool exactly. thing about the six by 11 and the reason we went, we went with it is because of the new USPS, United States Postal Service regulations. The postal charges on every single size available was the same. So I just went with a six by 11 because it's the same price. I'm talking about the bulk right. rate. Okay, it was 29 cents. So why go with a smaller mailer? I went with the six by 11, same postage size, a lot more real estate for design and copy. And it is definitely more than enough space to to, to drive people to a, a website. Totally, totally. Yeah, and that's and that's something you believe it or not, people get wrong. They want to send a big twelve page letter to drive someone online. It's just it's an overkill. You don't need to do that much copy for for that type of a, an offer. Um, the second thing that that a lot of people get wrong is so they, let's say that they do get the the right length of copy and they're doing a six by eleven postcard. Sometimes I'll see where they just put one call to action on there, meaning here's the URL you need to go to, and they mention it one time. And that's a huge mistake. I've tested this, and I've seen that you need to make that URL where you're driving them totally clear. You want to make sure that you put it on there three, four times um, so that there's no missing where, what they're supposed to do next. So it's really important when driving people online to use multiple you know, multiple calls of action, same action, but put it on there multiple times so the prospect knows exactly what to do, what URL to go to. And then the third thing that I really encourage people with is, and Dan, I think you'll really appreciate this, is when we're telling somebody to go online and you've got this, this postcard, the purpose of that postcard and that copy is to get them online. It's not to sell the product or service that they're going to hear about once they get online. You're supposed to at that let the online sales letter or video sell them the product or service. Your job at this point in the postcard is just to get them to go online. If you try and sell a product, say when they go online, they're going to buy a supplement. If you try and sell that supplement and sell them on the idea of going online, you've got two things you're trying to cover in one postcard. And that t- tends to be too much. So I found the best success is when you just focus on let's make the sales copy all about going online. Once they get there, then we can sell them the supplement or the product or service. And have you seen that too in the piece that you're working on, Dan? Or how do you feel about that? Oh, I've made the mistake myself. I've I've had great results using postcards to cold lists to generate leads. I've had I've had great results driving to online sites, but a few years back, I I felt I could take an eight and a half by eleven, you know, oversized postcard, not folded by the way, it's mailed flat, and I put like a basically like a magazine direct response ad, a, a headline, and three columns of copy. And I really thought I could sell a product from that. And I forget the price point. It was maybe 97, maybe as much as 197. No luck whatsoever. And if I just would have, you know what? I would have needed a direct mail package to sell that. Or 
a, a smaller postcard drive into the online presentation. So I've I've made that mistake before, but it dry, yeah, it works killer. One, just one message, one goal. Okay, you don't confuse the goal. You don't try to sell the supplement in the postcard and also get them to the website. Big boo-boo there. The only thing you're selling them on is getting to the website and then let that message there sell them. Exactly. I just see it so many so often when you'll get a seed piece, an L piece from somebody else, and I'll see that that they're trying to do both things. And, you know, it's just a, it's a huge mistake. I've seen it over and over again. And so it's just something to steer clear of. Keep your central focus on getting to the site, and that's it. Absolutely. And something I had to learn the hard way. By the way, um, the company, the catalog company I was trying to think of there, well, they're not just catalog coming there, a huge retail operation is Abercrombie and Fitch. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's but right. They mail millions of catalogs out. Now, I don't have the numbers. I saved it in another spot. I can't find it quickly. They attribute a very, I mean, they track this stuff. They're not just guessing <laughs> or they wouldn't be spending, you know, the millions mailing out these catalogs. Um, and and interesting about that, and the interesting yep. thing about that is the age in which it's going to, the age group is a younger demographic than, than what a lot of uh, traditional direct mail campaigns is. Normally you're going for the older generation, but in this case, in their case, it's a, I'm sure the generation is much younger. It is, it is much younger based on who I, based on what I know about the company and based on who I see walking in there. This is a much younger demographic. I mean, you know, we could probably generalize and even say 30 and younger, maybe 35 and younger. Okay. And, uh, you know, they attribute a huge percentage of their sales, crazy amount, 60, maybe even 70, 75% to the catalog, which is interesting because typically the demographic that responds to direct mail in various categories, especially health and financial, are the baby boomers and the seniors. But they are now finding that the, the much younger crowd, I forget the diff different generation, much younger than Generation X, uh, the, even as, as, as young as 18, that kind of cry, 18 to early 20s are way more receptive to direct mail than like the Generation Xers. And I believe that's the, the demographic that Aber, Abercrombie and Fitch is going after. Yeah, I would think so. That's, yeah, it's, it's good news. It's good news for those who are doing direct mail. And uh, obviously, as you've mentioned, if you're not, you're missing a huge, uh, huge gap in your in your um, opportunities to market. Definitely. Now, um, I noticed when I had my supplement business, for some reason, starting in 2007, a lot of things changed with my email marketing. I prior to 2007, I could do these long emails, whether it was content or a combination of content and sales pitch, or even I just sent the whole damn sales pitch in an email and we'll get incredible results, good open rates, good click throughs, which, you know, of course I tracked, but really that's totally irrelevant to me. I really don't care about that. All I care about is the bottom line, how much I sell. After 2007, for some reason, that totally changed. The longer emails were bombing. If I sent the whole pitch in email, it bombed. I had to resort to these really blind, almost curiosity-driven emails to drive people to the site. On top of that, is the, so having to change the style of email, on top of that, open rates started plummeting, click-through rates you know, to the sales site started plummeting, therefore, sales started plummeting. And so e email open rates are abysmal. Email delivery rates are a problem for a variety of reasons we won't go into. Open rates are abysmal for a lot of reasons. Uh, a lot of it has to do with 
stuff ain't getting to the inbox. And if it does get to the inbox, people are overwhelmed. If you do it right, you don't have those problems in direct mail. Yes, there are. There may be a, some slight deliverability problems. There may be some open problems. But if you do it right, you can get exponentially greater results than email as far as deliverability and open rate. So what are what are some of the simple ways people can get their mail delivered and opened? Yeah, there's uh, again, this is one of those things that we can't dive too deep into with the time we've got today, but I'll give you some some quick tips and things. And these may be things that are a little bit, um, some, they wouldn't be the typical thing you would think of when you think of how do I get my mail opened. Um, uh, and delivered is, getting it delivered is half the battle. So before they can even open it, they need to be able to have it show up at their house. And, and uh, the, this is where mailing lists come in and making sure that you have the right mailing list. Um, it's, it's too often where I see somebody or hear about somebody getting a mailing list and they get 20% of their mail returned because it's full of bad addresses. Or they send out a mail and they get zero response and you find out how they got their list and what the names are, who the names are on it as far as how they were generated. And you realize, well, there's, it makes sense that you didn't get any response. So you, you need to start out with the right mailing list. And if, you're, if you can't get the list right, then, uh, then your mailing's going to tank and it will not get delivered. Now, to get a good mailing list, the best, my suggestion is to always work with a list broker. And Dan, you and I work with the same broker. And it's, it, the thing with the list brokers, they, they're going to help steer you to the list that are, that they've seen have success in the past. They're going to help you out with uh, making sure that it's a reputable source and where they get the names. Too many people and too many businesses just go online. They find an online wholesaler of lists or some company that just generates lists online for you. You you tell them, hey, I'm looking for plumbers, and they send you a list of plumbers. Well, those types of lists end up not working. And so you really want to start with the right mailing list, and you need to start with going to a list broker who's, you know, who you can develop a relationship with, and they can make sure that you're getting the best lists. The second point is making sure you use the right format. You know, every niche has a, a specific type of format that they're going to be responsive to. Um, if you're mailing to seniors and you're mailing a joint pain supplement, a Magalog, which is like a magazine-style sales piece, has been the most successful type of format used over and over again for that joint pain niche. Um, if you're mailing into the financial niche trying to sell a newsletter or something like uh, that Agora does or um, any other large financial publishers, the format that seems to work the best over and over again is a digest size, which is uh, eight and a half by five and a half like Reader Digest size booklet. It's the kind of booklet that I mailed for Ken Roberts years ago. I'm still on that same format for financial publications today. If you're promoting um, driving people online, that's when you want to use the postcard. So knowing the right, the getting, in order to get your mail opened, you need to make sure that you're using the right format. What is it that the, the people in this niche, the prospects in this niche, what are they responding to? And if you're just getting started and you've never done direct mail, Go out and find out who the biggest in the direct mail business is in your niche. Find out what they're mailing, what format. Are they doing a 12-page letter? Are they mailing a postcard? Are they mailing a, a, a digest or a tear sheet? Find out whatever it is that they're mailing, and then that's a good place to start because if they're mailing a format that's working for them to your niche, then there's a good chance that's what you need to mail as well. If you're doing a, a seminar for financial advisors, and you see that all the other financial advisors are mailing an invitation piece, a piece that kind of looks like a wedding invitation, and you go ahead and mail out a, a postcard, well, you may find out that yours doesn't work as well, and the reason might be because the format that gets the highest response is that invitation mailer. So you want to make sure you get the right list using a good broker, and two, you want to make sure you mail the right format. The third thing that I encourage to get your mail delivered and opened is to make sure once you get that list, to make sure you have it cleaned properly. And what I mean by cleaned is you want to make sure that you take out all the bad addresses, you remove anybody that doesn't have a complete zip code. You know, sometimes you'll get a list and you'll look at it and instead of having five digits for the zip code, it may only have four. Well, that piece is that name is not going to get delivered. And I found that 
many times the average list may have 10 to 15 percent of the list may have addresses that need to be either corrected or deleted. So say on 10,000 pieces, if you order 10,000 names, you may find that 1,500 of those names are worthless unless you clean them up by having the correct zip codes applied or having them removed from the mail file. And that can, that can add up to a lot of money when you figure out the printing and postage and all that goes into it. So my, I guess my three quick tips for getting your mail delivered and open is making sure you get the right list, making sure you mail the right format, and then making sure that you clean your list properly. Good tips, and and about working with a list broker, it's 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 an, a good enlist list broker is an invaluable. I've I've gotten so excited about lists I've found, <clears throat> but if you know a good list broker, they know the inside information on all these lists, and they know who's tested it, and they know these results, and you think based on a list description, it looks like your ideal list, you know. Uh, the, the, the angels have ascended from heaven and you found the list that's going to make you rich. And the list broker tells you, oh, that is one big fraud. That, compa- that contained names of dead people. Um, so, you know, nobody can get results with that list. So that's that's been a huge tip there about getting the right list. The most important thing about your direct mail piece, even if you've got half-assed copy is the eyeballs reading it. If you got the right list, you're you're halfway there. Craig, we we agreed upon an hour. I we've gone over. It is three fifteen and I know you're busy. Um so we can um call it quits if that's what you need to do. Or if you've got a couple more minutes, we can handle a couple more questions. But I, I totally understand if you got to run. Well, let's do let's do one more question, and then we'll we'll close it up after that. And we can, you can tell we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Well, I I, I was going to talk about the mistakes, some of the, the biggest, biggest mistakes. mistakes. People and I think that ties back mail. into a question. I think that ties back into a question we talked about early on too, which would be important to discuss if that's okay. Yeah, I'd I'd like to talk about that. I and I'd like to get in a quick. My God, people who aren't regularly di- 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 sending direct mail to their list of buyers. I, I have found. Well, I won't get into the details. I have found they are leaving as much as fifty percent of their potential monthly income on the table. And now there's a way to do it with very low risk with the special list selection techniques. So you can just uh, clean a house by mailing your, 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 your customer list. We won't get into that. But uh, yeah, since it does tie into what we talked about earlier, if you would talk about the biggest mistakes people make in direct mail and, and how do they can avoid that. Yeah, so this is this is one of my favorite topics to talk about with direct mail, and it is it is the biggest mistake that people make. And so, if you're listening to this, you know, hopefully you're not making this mistake. If you are, hopefully you'll correct it. And you know, I've consulted with over 100 different companies, and and the common theme when somebody's failing at direct mail, this is the one area they're failing at. This is the one thing that they're doing wrong. And it doesn't have to do with their format or their list or their copy or the direct mail piece. It has everything to do with the way they look at their customers and the value of each customer. Um, when, you would, when you do a direct mail campaign, you can't think short term. You can't think of how much money am I making from this campaign. You have to look long term. You have to look at what we talked about earlier, the customer lifetime value. And something interesting, uh, Dan, I did a few years ago, I did a study on 50,000 buyers from direct mail versus 50,000 buyers from TV and radio versus 50,000 buyers online. This is a big publishing company I was working with. So we took 150,000 people, 50,000 from each medium, and we took a look at their lifetime value, the customer lifetime value. We found that those who came in the door through direct mail would spend three times as much with a company as somebody who was generated online and twice as much as somebody who was generated through TV. So when you do direct mail, you have to really take a close look at the customer lifetime value because they will spend more than any of the other customers coming in the door. And you have to take that into account when you do direct mail campaigns. 
so the biggest mistake that I see made is not calculating in the lifetime value of a customer with each mailing. So if it costs you, let's say you're selling a product for um, $150. And let's say your direct mail campaign, your cost per acquisition, it cost you $150 to bring that customer in. Well, you may look at it and say, well, I broke even. I didn't make any money and I didn't lose any money. And some people would look at that and say, well, that's a loss. But if you look at, say, 30, 60, 90 days down the road and you do other campaigns to them, and you sell them other products and service, you may find that that person you brought in the door for $150, you may find that they spend $300, $500, $700 or more with you. And if they do, you know, wouldn't you be willing to spend $150 to make $500 off of somebody? And the answer is, yeah, you know, most people would. But a lot of companies are unwilling or don't think to add in the lifetime value of each customer when they evaluate the campaign. Very similar to your, your client that we were talking about early on. So that's, my, uh, that's one of my biggest, uh, what I see to be the biggest mistake. And I'm sure, Dan, you see that too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really frustrating because the, the key, one of the keys I found to to increasing that lifetime customer value and recuperating the, the, the money that it costs to acquire that customer and then making money month after month is regular direct mail to the customer list. Now, I won't get into the details. It doesn't mean you have to mail your entire customer list every month. In fact, that's probably a mistake, but there are ways to do it to, to get the maximum ROI, but people don't do it. They just email and um, they have no idea how much money they're leaving on the table. And I think it's also a mindset issue. I, I still don't get this. Th these people think by getting a customer that should immediately get them into profit. And they've got what I call a churn and burn business. Yeah. I got a customer, I made 50 bucks, I'm done. There's no back-end marketing to build a relationship with that customer, you know, and what could be, a, you know, a one-time customer, if you do it right and use direct mail, this could be a customer who stays with you for years or decades and, and spends thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. Really, really frustrating for me to get that through people's thick skulls. You've been very generous with your time and I've kept you over the time we have allocated. You, you've got a new book out. I signed up for an advanced copy months ago and I was so excited when it arrived the other day called The Direct Mail Solution, A Business Owner's Guide to Building a Lead Generating, Sales Driving, Money Making Direct Mail Campaign that you co-wrote with Dan Kennedy, which I got off of Amazon. And again, you are, you know, my go-to guy for direct mail. Anybody who is planning a direct mail campaign or wants to figure out how to incorporate direct mail, uh, because you can see some exponential increases in your business when you do it right, according to Craig's method. How would you recommend people get in touch with you? Yeah, I think uh, you know this. You know, we we we've, we've talked a long time here, but we we haven't even scratched the surface, right? With direct mail, I mean, you know, there's so many more things that you and I could cover today. We just don't have time. But that's really the reason I wrote the book is because there was so many different parts and elements with direct mail that I wanted people to know about that I had to sit down and put it all in one in one book. And it took me over three years to to, to write it. So it's my my hand to, to pen there, and it's. Um, you know, all the details and tips I go into detail in every area. So when you are doing a direct mail campaign, you know what to do. Um, the best way to get the, the book is to, you can go to Amazon like you suggested, or you can go to the directmailbook.com and it gives you some different order options for ordering the book. And, you know, I would appreciate it. And I, and I, I think that you'll find that there's um, no detail left uncovered when it comes to direct mail in the book. It really does go into to all the, the tips and techniques for giving you the best chance for success with direct mail. So the directmailbook.com would be the best place to go to go purchase that book. I, I pre-ordered it months ago because I want to make sure I didn't miss it, but on the directmailbook.com, you're also 
giving away some bonuses, aren't you? Aren't you giving three issues well, of your Mailbag Millionaire newsletter? Well, yes. I'm actually, if you, um, if they want to, if someone orders today or um, the next few days, I'll, I'll give them three issues of my newsletter, the Mailbag Millionaire newsletter. And basically, all you have to, the, the newsletter is. Um, it's thirty nine dollars per issue, so it's uh, you know one hundred nineteen dollar value that you get for free just by ordering the book. So the way it works is if I'll give you three issues. If you order the book, forward me the receipt showing that you've ordered it, and I will send you out three issues of the Mailbag Millionaire newsletter. And you just simply uh, forward your your order showing that you've ordered it to info at simpson direct dot com. So that's info, I-N-F-O, at simpson-direct.com. So send me a copy of the receipt. Show me that you've ordered the book, and I'll send you three issues of the Mailbag Millionaire newsletter. Okay, so go go to the, the directmailbook.com right away and order this because, um, listen, I can guarantee you probably if you're just – most online marketers, you are literally leaving. You are stepping over dollars to pick up dimes if you don't have a direct mail component. And in most cases, and businesses I've evaluated, you are literally leaving 50% of your sales and income on the table every single month if you don't have a direct mail component. Also, the newsletter bonuses you're giving away, I I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but when you get those bonuses, you're going to see a technique for making your mail irresistible to open that actually I've only seen Craig use. So that in itself <laughs> is a highly valuable lesson. And I don't want to ruin the description. I don't want to ruin the surprise. They just need to see it for themselves. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know what the thing is, is it's, uh, this is, if you're gonna, if you're even considering doing direct mail, this is the guide. This is what you need to know in order to make it successful. And not only do you get the book, but then you get the three issues of the newsletter, which are all tips and techniques and, you know, for doing direct mail. There really is huge value in this, and I really hope that everyone takes advantage of it. I agree. They'll, they'll find a lot of value in this. If, like most people, I recognize instead of me going through a two to three year learning curve on things and, you know, losing lots of money in two years of my life. I usually <laughs> order information like this to get myself up to speed. And then I've just found it way more effective to just go to the source and, and, and contact the, uh, the expert. So if someone is intelligent enough to do that, how would you recommend they contact you? Uh, the best way is just to, to email info, info at simpson-direct.com. That really is the, the best way to, to, get to, to get in touch with me, um, to also show me that you've ordered the book, and I'll get you copies of the free newsletters. So the, really the best method to start out with is the info at simpson-direct.com. Okay, great. Well, hey, I kept you way past our time. We promised. I appreciate you being generous with your time, and I – Appreciate the info, Craig. This is this. I know from experience. This is life changing, business changing, a business doubling in rapid time information. So thanks for sharing all your tips and secrets, Craig. Well, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And you know, I always enjoy talking to you. I always feel like you're the the ghost of Gary Halbert with your copywriting style, so similar to his. It, every time I read your newsletter or, or read something you wrote, it makes me feel like I'm reading something Gary wrote. So, uh, so I, I really appreciate you having me on this call and being a part of it. Oh, thank you. I I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. I I, I am I'm, I am honestly not trying to emulate Halbert. I really think there's some, there was something in the water in Barberton, Ohio, where we both grew up that warps your mind. And I think that's the contributing factor of why Halbert and I think so, think so, so alike. Uh, uh, that, that Barberton, Ohio water or something. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that's funny. Well, thanks, Craig. Thanks again for everything, and uh, uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Hope you enjoyed today's show. 
Canine Crew got a special treat for you. What we are affectionately referring to as the Off the Chain Hotline. Tell us you love us. Tell us you hate us. Ask questions. We don't care. Just call 321-424-6043 and give us a piece of your mind. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to create rivers of revenue from your existing customers, then the next thing you need to do is go to DobermanDan.com. He's given away a free copy of his $98 per month Doberman Dan letter just for listening to the show. Go to DobermanDan.com now and sign up for your free issue. This is the PodcastFactory.com.